Back pain is unfortunately a fairly common experience for cross-country skiers, but there are things you can do, especially with your technique, to help protect the spine and the shoulders, and that's the topic of this video. The first part is about the shoulders, and the second part is about the spine. I'll describe some basic anatomy and then talk about how we can use that understanding of how our bodies are designed to better inform the ways we ski. We're designed to move ourselves around mainly with our legs, but in cross-country skiing, we also use the arms because we push with the poles. The legs and the arms are attached to the body differently because they evolved for different purposes, and that's something we should keep in mind when we think about how best to use our bodies in this sport. In this illustration, everything in white is called the axial skeleton, which is the central pillar of the body, and the arms and the legs are attached to the axial skeleton through girdles. There's the pelvic girdle and the shoulder girdle. We'll look at the pelvic girdle first. So the pelvic girdle is attached to the axial skeleton at the base of the spine. There's a large plate at the base of your spine called your sacrum, and that's where the connection is at the SI joints. And then the legs are attached to the pelvic girdle at the hip joint, and that's a very uh, snug and secure connection. So the whole pelvic region of the body is um, it's very ruggedly constructed and it's built to be hard wearing because it supports the weight of the body and it receives the ground reaction forces that help us move ourselves around in space. In comparison, the shoulder girdle is more finely constructed. So the shoulder girdle is made up of the collarbone at the front of the body and the shoulder blades at the back of the body. So you can see the bones are smaller and they're separate. They're not fused together like we saw in the pelvis. The shoulder girdle is attached to the axial skeleton at the front of the body where the collarbone attaches to the top of the breastplate and you should be able to feel around that joint with your fingertips if you just explore that region underneath the chin. At the back of the body, the joint between the shoulder blades and the ribs is very loosely constructed and just made of soft tissue. This is another view of the shoulder girdle. So here's your collarbone or clavicle and the shoulder blade or scapula at the back. And then the arm bone fits into a little um, space in the scapula. And so that joint is also a ball and socket joint, just like down in the hips. But this one is often described as being like a golf ball sitting on top of a tee. So it's not a tight, secure connection like we saw down in the hips. It's much looser and again, it offers a lot more mobility. There's a lot of delicate tissue that has to transit through the shoulder region. So there's the long, uh, long tendons off the muscles of the arms. There's the blood vessels and the nerves and all of this tissue, which is quite delicate, is threaded through tiny spaces in the shoulder joint. So overall, the shoulder joint has a very fine, a relatively more fine and delicate construction, especially compared to the pelvis, because it's designed to accommodate a lot of movement and we don't normally support the weight of our bodies with our arms or move ourselves around in space with our arms. Now let's think about the anatomy of the shoulders as we look at some examples of skiing. So we'll use double pulling as our example and I've got two Canadian athletes who have kindly agreed to be our demonstration athletes. Over on this side, this is Emily Nishikawa and she's going to demonstrate how you don't want to move your shoulders in double pull technique. And over here, Olivia Buffard Nesbitt is going to demonstrate better uh, shoulder positioning and movement. So what I would like to draw your attention to is that as Emily swings her arms and pulls up to the front position, she's going to allow her whole, all that structure of her shoulder girdle to kind of hike up and lift up like she's shrugging her shoulders up around her neck and her head is in a very forward position. So do you see what her posture looks like as she's swinging up to the start position? So you can just think about all of the delicate tissue 
tissues and the fine construction of the shoulder and how you're really shrugging all that up very aggressively. And then when it comes time to pulling, she's then in that poor posture at the moment where she's going to load a lot of force and pressure into the tissues through the poles. And then in comparison, if we look at Olivia over here, um, I think the easiest way to look at this is to focus on the space between the ears and the shoulders, the top of the shoulders. And she's doing a really good job of keeping her shoulders down and connected as she recovers back to the front position. And then when it's time for her to load all that pressure and force into the shoulders, the shoulders and the head and the upper back are all in a much better position. So it's not that it's bad to move the shoulders, it's just a matter of degree. So here, if you're going out hour after hour, day after day, year after year, and you're always so sloppy in the shoulder positioning and in the upper back posture, then I think that you are putting yourself at a higher risk of developing issues. So instead, in your skiing, think of keeping the shoulders down and relaxed, the back of the neck long and extended all the way from between the shoulder blades to the base of the skull. Keep your chest open and broad from the top of the breastplate and draw the collarbones wide so that the shoulders don't round forward. So that was the shoulders and next I'll talk about the spine. Before I get into this next topic, I should let you know this video is from the website nordicskilab.com, which is a member supported website where you can get access to many more videos that can help you ski farther, faster and with less effort. If you enjoy this video format, check us out at nordicskilab.com. There are a number of things we can say about the spine and ski technique. Everything I cover in this video applies to all ski techniques. There are additional things to say about diagonal stride, but I'll save those for a follow-up video. The topics I want to focus on are spinal flexion and the health of the discs in the spine. But before I get to that, I want to quickly mention forward lean. So forward lean refers to um, the positioning that we carry in the majority of our ski techniques where the body is angled forward. And um, the reason that's significant is because usually we're standing more upright in space. And so when um, you think about the way that gravity is affecting you when you're standing upright, it's pretty much all compression on the spine. But in in cross-country skiing, because we've tilted ourselves forward, more of those gravitational forces, it changes the direction that the way the field of gravity is working across the tissues at the back. And we have a lot more shearing forces than we would if we held the body more upright. There isn't a lot you can do about this. Uh, One thing you can do is you just can make sure that you don't get too heavy through the back. The more the spine is angled forward, the more significant those shearing forces will be. So you don't want to lean the body too far forward. Um, But other than that, the forward lean is important to the sport. And I brought it up mostly because I just wanted to highlight that there is already kind of this underlying um, extra layer of stress that we're putting on the back in cross-country skiing just from this forward position. Okay, so like I said, I want to talk about spinal flexion and the health of the discs in the spine. So spinal flexion is referring to any movement where you take the spine into a more rounded C shape. So if you look especially at the lower back, when you see that curve in the lower back round out, and now you're in spinal flexion. So you have a you can either deliberately flex the spine or the spine can sit in a flexed position just from poor posture. And then the discs, those are the soft, like cushion-like structures that sit between the vertebrae in the spine along the length of the spine, and they help to uh, provide some shock absorption. These discs are sometimes compared to a jelly donut because the outer layers of the disc 
are made of a firmer, um, more resilient structure than the inside of the disc. So the inside is a little bit more fluid and pasty than the outer layers. Now let's think about what's happening to those discs uh, during spinal flexion. So over here is another model of the spine. The head would be at the top. These vertebrae are the vertebrae in the neck. These are the ones in the upper back where the, um, the ribs are attached. These are the vertebrae in the lower back, and then that's the sacrum and the tailbone. So you can see that the spine has a little bit of an S-shaped curve to it. And you can see a similar shape over here in our skier. And so this spine is facing the same direction as the skier is facing. This would be the front of the body. And these are the little bumps that you feel along the length of your spine if you run your fingers up and down your back. So let's zoom in and think a little bit more about what's happening to these discs. Um, during spinal flexion. So normally, if you were upright in space, you could imagine that the pressure uh, working across the discs is quite even across the surface of the discs. But when we take the back into that C curve there, that would be the same as taking this lumbar area and rounding it out. You can imagine how now you're starting to add a little bit more pressure along the front edges of the vertebrae. And thinking back to that donut, it's like you're squeezing together one side of the donut. I also want to point out a little bit about what's happening up at the neck. So you can see that as she loses the curve in the lower back and rounds the spine into that C shape, then the uh, shoulders roll forward and the um, they bunch up around the neck and she starts to hinge uh, into the space at the base of the skull. Now this little model is designed to show you um, what can happen to at the level of the discs with that repeated aggressive spinal flexion so this is one vertebrae and this is the other vertebrae and then sitting between them is a model of the discs and then again this would be the front of the body in this direction and these are the little bumps that you feel down the length of your spine this is the spinal cord here and then these are the uh, nerve roots coming off of the spine so again, if we're putting the back into flexion, so rounding it like that, we'll be preferentially pinching the front side of the vertebrae together and squeezing that area while pulling this area apart. And this little model will just give you a, a mental image of what that might look like. So you can see that the disc starts to deform and that's fine. You, um, you can imagine that if you were moving your back around in different directions, that disc would constantly be deforming and then it would kind of bounce back into position. But if you're not moving it in all directions and kind of wearing it evenly, you can see how if this is most of your movement, how you could start to get some of the disc squeezing out at the back. And if the inside material that jelly like material starts to squeeze out you could even get a herniation so you can see how that could has the potential to start to irritate the nerves and potentially cause some pain okay let's get back to talking about skiing and practical things you can do to help protect your spine in your skiing so this is olivia again and this video was taken a few years after the one where you saw a lot of aggressive spinal flexion in her technique and what you're going to notice now is she is uh, skiing with a much more neutral spine so you can see the s-shaped curve of her spine and as she works into her polling technique the she starts to lose some of that inward curve in the lower back and the spine flattens more but she doesn't go into that aggressive rounded position like she had before and in between the time that these two videos were taken, she did experience a lot of trouble with back pain. And this is something that she put a lot of work and attention into in order to improve. If we get back to thinking about those shearing forces that we have just, we're experiencing just because we're in this kind of forward position, um, 
the shape of the spine will affect the amount of shearing forces that are going into the back as well. And so when the back is in, uh, when the lower back has that inward curve, it's called a lordotic curve. And in that shape, the same movement will have less shearing forces than if you put the back into a rounded position. There'll be a lot more shear acting on the discs in that situation, and not just the discs, but all the tissues and the joints in the, in, in the spine. So basically, your spine can tolerate a lot more when it's in a neutral alignment, meaning when you have the natural S-shaped curve of the spine. So what Olivia is doing is she is um, working to keep a more neutral alignment in her spine in her double pull technique, but she does um, she does have some flexion working into her back as she pulls, and I think that is. Um, is what you would expect from most skiers. It would be very, very hard to not get any flexion into the, in the spine. Um, but it's a there's a big difference between keeping the spine long and extended and deliberately rounding and crunching into the back as you work your ski poles. And it's not that the spine can't flex spinal flexion is not bad or evil the spine is designed to move it's designed to flex it's designed to back bend it's designed to rotate and side bend all of these are good and healthy things for your spine to do it's just a matter of degree in cross-country skiing just like in life if you're spending all day sitting at your desk in spinal flexion sitting at your car in spinal flexion riding your bike in spinal flexion and then you go out and you exercise and you're putting even more aggressive spinal flexion into your movement you can see how that can be too much it's too much of that one thing and not enough of all the other healthy movements that you should be working um working your spine into so that you end up with a spine that is well balanced and mobile and strong in all directions. So the bottom line is uh, be nice to your spine, be nice to your shoulders so that you can enjoy the sport of cross-country skiing for many, many years. My name is Kim McKenney. I'm one of the coaches at the website Nordic Ski Lab. I live in Western Canada and I have a master's degree in neuroscience and I used my educational background and some research and my understanding of ski technique to put together the information in this video. I do want to stress that I'm not a a therapist, I'm not a back pain specialist, and if you're experiencing pain, um, you should be seeking help from a medical professional, not from YouTube. Um, But I'm hoping that The information in this video helps you either prevent problems in the future or if you are dealing with problems, gives you some ideas that you can then further explore with a qualified professional. And I'll just remind you one more time that if you enjoy learning about ski technique with videos like this, you should visit us at nordicskilab.com. We have skiers and coaches from around the world in our membership and it's a really fun place to be.